everyone. My name is Liliana Griego. I'm here at the Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Reserve that is home to over 200 bird species that was recently burned by a wildfire. Today we're going to go explore and search for some of our feathered friends and also talk to some folks about all the wonderful work they're doing to help improve the ecosystem in this area. We usually see different herons, green heron, blue heron sometimes, some egrets, uh, lots of mallards, coots, Canadian geese. Sometimes you can find white pelicans here. I don't know when they come exactly, but... My name's uh, Tom Ryan. I've been working with Polar on doing the bird surveys out at, here at the Sepulveda Basin. And this started out as a study looking at recovery of sites that had been restored. And it has turned into a story on recovery from burns. So this is our third major brush fire um, in the year since we started this, this mm -hmm. project. The area out here is the area that we think you know, needs to be restored. We tend to see a lot of small seed eaters out here, um, a lot of fly catchers, and last winter there was a burrowing owl that spent the winter out here. This was a nice little riparian corridor. It has since burned. And this spring we had at least three pairs of least bells vireos in here. We actually detected juveniles with the adults, which indicates that the nests were successful. Since the fire came in, and we did find some here in the riparian area, and it definitely got affected by the fire, how, like, are they gonna have to rebuild their nests here? Or do you think the babies are now, like, big enough to just be on their own? Yeah, the fire actually occurred at a fairly decent time in their annual cycle. We were reaching the point where some vireos have already migrated. Um, if these guys hadn't migrated, they were probably just a couple weeks away from it. And, you know, in all likelihood, as the fire came up, they moved into another habitat. We can also hear a kingfisher. Oh, it's oh. just stopped right over there. Oh yeah, I can see it, nice. Some of the, the little flycatchers, a bird called the Black Phoebe, it's a very common flycatcher. You see them in, in parks around here, people's backyards. You've seen a Cooper's hawk, um, and we saw a red-tailed hawk already. So she's out hunting over the, uh, the recently burned area. So that makes sense that they're out and about because this is kind of an ideal situation for them because now everything's exposed. What we're doing out here is we're using what's called a point count technique in order to um, get a measurement of the bird abundance and diversity. So abundance is you know, the total number of each species out here, and then the diversity is the number of species we encounter. So I stand here and I count everything that I detect within 30 meters or about 100 feet radius around me. Then I separate that and then count everything beyond 30 meters. If something just flies across the site, we get a lot of gulls and ducks moving back and forth. Uh, we note those separately as well. Have you noticed any major differences since the last time we, you came out here to now, given everything, like oh, next yeah. to the riparian area? Yeah, no, the, the overall abundance and the uh, the diversity of the birds is, is definitely down. The fire tends to initially benefit birds that eat seeds, um, just because that's kind of all that's left. Some of the ones that we expect to see out here would be the house finch, lesser goldfinch. You tend to see a lot of doves out here. Doves are great generalists, um, pigeons and doves. And gen um, oh. There's a red-tailed hawk right up behind a you. So that's a yeah juvenile red-tailed hawk. So how do you know it's juvenile, Tom? It's got that big white bib on the chest. And then if you look at the tail, despite the name, it doesn't have a red tail. There it goes. Oh, I think there's a Says Phoebe. It's like really orange on the bottom. Oh, okay, you just... 
Oh, yeah. It's just, I don't even know. I can't even see it with my naked eye without using the binoculars. <laughs> it's like straight this way in the, it's gotta jump eventually. Oh, it just jumped. Oh yeah, yeah. Space baby, okay. It's a really pretty bird. I like the color. And song sparrows too. Mm. I've heard a couple. The hypothesis of the, the, the experiment is that we'll have equal numbers of both abundance and diversity in the areas that have been restored and the control sites eventually. All right, time's up. Time to move to the next spot. So what's next, Tom? Well, um, we actually just finished with the, uh, the first year of the study. We were funded for a year. Okay. Hopefully the surveys will be able to continue at regular intervals. You know, it's a very valuable little piece of habitat right here in the middle of the city, basically. That's definitely a hidden gem. It just needs a little bit of, of TLC. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now we're gonna head over and visit our friends uh, from California Native Plant Society. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us this morning and for all the wonderful work that you do. All right, well, thank you guys for doing all the work with the, the river and these adjacent <laughs> habitats, too. Backbar. I'm Vice President of Programs for Friends of Los Angeles River, and we are now in the Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Reserve, and we're joining some volunteers from California Native Plant Society to talk about all the work that they've done in here for decades. Steve! Hey there, Shelly! It's good to see you! Nice to see you, too! <laughs> Virtual hug! So we'd love for you to tell us about you know, what you're doing here and why and how. The Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Reserve started off being cornfields, then it was a uh, turf farm for a little while, and then finally we got a wildlife reserve here in 1988. The problem is, is that there's a lot of weeds that are left over from the time that it was in agriculture. So over the years, we discovered that people walking along the trail here we're just walking through fields of mustard like you see the dried remnants of right here. People thinking that mustard is native, but it's not. It's an invasive plant from the Mediterranean region that was brought here by the Spanish missionaries, of course, because it has lots of value as a food item. There's really no life in it. There's nothing there for birds to eat, does not have any insects on it because they're from somewhere else, and so therefore, it's of no value for the wildlife. By eliminating the mustard, we create habitat space for our native plants. The other thing the mustard does is that it actively puts chemicals in the soil that inhibit the growth of the native plants. Underneath the mustard is our nemesis, whorehound, which is another medicinal herb from the Mediterranean that was probably brought by the Spanish missionaries. We have to actually do a lot of manual work because even if we were to herbicide it, you can't herbicide this whorehound that's deep inside the coyote bush right here. You might be wondering who's here doing this work as volunteers. Well, this is the California Native Plant Society. This is the Los Angeles Santa Monica Mountains chapter. We have our volunteers, George Waddell, Robert Grizziliak, and Ann Abramson. We've been working on this project with others for over a decade. We've cleared out thousands of bags of weeds over the years and really got this area so when you used to walk along the main trail, you would really see a slice of Southern California riparian ecology that was true to form. Can you give us a, a little bit more about what we can do and what we're working toward the vision of when we can get this mustard eradicated? So now that we have this wonderful opportunity where most of the wildlife reserve has burned and most of the mustard has been eliminated, the Native Plant Society is gonna work on a three-year project to try to eliminate all the mustard in all the areas that have been burnt along with all of any other of the non-native plants that would come up. Basically, keep the wildlife reserve weed-free, 
and it'll attract the kind of birds that we used to have, including the federally endangered least bell vireo that we used to hear regularly, even up until just a, up until right before the fire. George Waddell, he's made over 5,000 seed balls, which we're gonna scatter throughout the wildlife reserve. George, can you talk to us about kind of what we see as a vision for this area? What it is, it's a prairie. It's an annual prairie. The plants come up and when it rains, the plants come up, they flower, they set their seed, it gets dry, they die. So what we found is that if, if you get rid of the mustard for about three years, it's very weak after that. It doesn't come back very much. And the other, the native plants, are able to take advantage of the, the poisons not in the soil anymore and they can just go. We have prairies in California. We have native prairies. When John Muir came into the Central Valley for the first time when he walked across to the Sierra, he talked about just walking through bloom all the way. And that's what should be here. I'm bringing seeds from my own garden. I got five different kinds and I'm making mud balls out of them. Little balls like marbles. Each one has maybe 40 seeds of five different kinds in it. I'd like to have that across the entire area. Something like that could be extremely beautiful. And the seed feeds the birds. It would be great if we could walk over and you could show us the project that you did um, with funding from the Xerces Society. Last fall, we got word about the Xerces Society was giving a grant to um, allow people to plant pollinating species. They supplied us and many other groups with 1,600 little starts, little bitty baby plants. The most important was milkweed because they're very concerned about the, the loss of the uh, monarch butterfly. They need to have patches of milkweed that they can lay their eggs on. George, thank you so much. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what the California Native Plant Society has done and continues to do here. Every time I come out here, I see something that I've never seen before. That's why our volunteer group meets twice a week, uh, six a dawn, we work about three hours, and we've been doing it for over a decade. So it takes a combination of public involvement and the city to maintain the infrastructure and whatnot for it to really work. And of course, this is a, considered a world-class urban wildlife reserve, something that Los Angeles should be proud of and work really hard to work towards bringing it back and making it as good as it used to be. The great thing is that we've started with funds from Prop 1. That's got us to this point. So a year's worth of funding, a year's worth of activity, there's more to be done. We look forward to going back and continuing this work. There's a plethora of wildlife here in the heart of the city, so close to the LA River. Why should we have to drive to the Antelope Valley to see wildflowers? We've got 60 plus acres here, just ready for us to get to that day when we can throw out the seed bombs that George's been making. And we hope that you join us to do that. Thank you for tuning in on this Upper River treasure. We look forward to seeing you next time. Finding Feathered Friends is brought to you by REI.